researchers and fellow students. First of all, uh, thank you to Renew for organizing this webinar. And thank you, Professor Nazima, for accepting our invitation as a speaker today. Also, thanks to our participants for spending time with us this morning, despite your tight schedule. For your information, our webinar today is live streamed on YouTube as well. To ensure the smooth running of this webinar, I would like to seek your kind cooperation for the participants from the participants on Webex to remain mute during the presentation. We will be having a Q&A session at the end of the webinar. You can drop your questions in the chat box and I will read out the question on your behalf. Or for our participants in Webex, you may unmute yourself to ask the question directly to our speaker. To start with, allow me to introduce myself. My, my name is Anida Yusuf, Head of a Research Grant Acquisition Unit, Research Management Center, RMC UITM. I'll be the moderator for today's session. For your information, Professor Nazima has a very long and impressive CV but I will make a brief introduction for her today. Professor Nazima is a professor of food science at School of Science, Auckland University of Technology, AUT, New Zealand. She obtained her degree in Bachelor of Food Science from the University of Nottingham, UK in year 1991, and her master in food biotechnology and PhD in food science from the University of Strathclyde. UK in year 1992 and 1997, respectively. Upon completion of her studies, Professor Nazima served as the principal research scientist at Standards and Industrial Research Institute Malaysia, CIRIM. Driven by her immense interest in teaching, she then joined University Putra Malaysia in year 1996 as a lecturer. Next, in year 2007, she served as a senior lecturer at the University of Otago, New Zealand for two years prior to joining Auckland University of Technology, New Zealand. She was promoted to associate professor in year 2013 and was awarded her full professorship in year 2017. She is our visiting professor in UITM during her sabbatical. Professor Nazima has nearly 30 years of experience in food science with a significant track record in leading research project, as well as uh, fostering and inspiring research students to publish in high quality inter internationally recognized journal. She has supervised uh, 11 PhD students and 46 master students, and currently there are 11 PhD and one master student under her supervision. Professor Nazima has uh, 186 publication with a H index of 41 in Scopus with 4,831 citations and a H index of 51 in Google Scholar with 7,444 citations. She is also actively serving as editors for prestigious journals such as Frontiers in Nutrition, Frontiers in Food Science and Technology, Molecules, Foods, Legume Science and Sustainability. And that summarizes her 30 years of experience in three minutes. Her vast experience make her the best candidates for the sharing session today, which is experience with industrial and international grant application. As saying goes, the beginning is always the hardest and the biggest question is always how to start applying for the industrial and international grant. Well, I believe our participants can't wait to listen to the tips in applying industrial and international grants application. So without further ado, I would like to invite Professor Nazima to start her sharing session. Prof, the Webex floor is yours. Please welcome Professor Nazima. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Anida, for your kind introduction and welcome all to uh, this, this sharing session and I look forward to having some discussions with you around this topic. 
So I'm going to give you a talk on the ex on my experience with uh, industrial and international grants application. To tell the truth, uh, international grants have been competitive, highly competitive, and uh, I'm still trying uh, to get good ones. And uh, that requires a lot of networking. And that's why I'm on these travels during my sabbaticals to seek out opportunities like this. So I'll start off with my first one. So why do you apply for funding? Okay, we are academics uh, in the university and it's a means of our career enhancements because uh, that gives you academic recognition, prestige and promotion. So that's why, uh, you know, uh, funding is essential. In addition, you also need funding to support the research that you and your students carry out, okay? So the students may have some uh, money allocated for research, but often enough, it's not good enough, all right? Uh, we, we still need to seek some contributions externally. The third reason you might want to apply for funding is the freedom to creatively follow your idea and the data. So you have all these ideas in your head and, and you want to get them implemented somehow. And so uh, in order to do that, you need to secure funding because nothing, uh, you, you have to pay for virtually everything, especially if you're in the sciences. The la uh, lastly is knowledge to successfully bridge to entrepreneurial success. So you're, if, if you aspire to, to um, open a business and uh, you, you need to uh, have some funding to do so, and uh, you often research is a good way uh, that can bring you business success as well. Because uh, the research we do in food science is all about food. And a lot of the food that you see in the supermarket are formulated by food scientists. And so it can be a business opportunity for some people. And I've noticed in the uh, Department of Food Science, you, you, you have that um, arm where you have, uh, you know, you have startup companies. So uh, really funding is essential. I'm going to talk about industry funding and some of the benefits uh, shortly, but I'll just give you a quick snapshot on what public private sector shared R&D fund grants are. So usually with universities, uh, we, we have our own uh, funding system. Okay, those are the internally funded uh, research projects that you can apply within the universities. But uh, it's always good to seek funding from the private sector, small business research grants, because you're able to bring research um, in, in the industry uh, by, um, by having partnerships with them. There are countless benefits in uh, carrying out research with the industry. It not only benefits students, so it provides students uh, non-curricular learning. So students who work on this sort of collaborative projects with the industry learn how the industry works. And that is not part of the curriculum that we teach often uh, at, at, at uni. Then there's um, good things like scholarships and stipends uh, that comes uh, with uh, some of this uh, collaborative research with, with industries. And I'll share with you some of my experience um, in terms of uh, this sort of scholarship and stipends. So with the funding, uh, you, you can uh, provide funding for either a master's or PhD student with, uh, uh, with a Callaghan Innovation in New Zealand. And I'll talk about that briefly. Uh, experience working on real world projects and settings. 
often what we do at university, the sort of research we do tend to be a bit different from what the industry needs. And I think we need to uh, bridge that gap between industry and university. All right, uh, because these are real world projects uh, when you work with industries, they have got problems they want solved and they need research to be carried out to, to resolve those problems and find solutions. Often um, students will get the opportunity to work on large scale projects with, with a large number of people and they are needed to uh, adhere or stick to hard deadlines too. So that gives them a taste of what it's like to work in the, in the industry. So it's very beneficial. In addition, uh, the great benefit to students when working on uh, collaborative research with industries is that the student is more familiar with the industry culture and thereby they will learn to appreciate that quality of working in the industry and are able to keep abreast with technological and uh, environmental changes. All right, so often uh, we find that uh, if students work on this sort of collaborative projects with the industry, they often get hired by the industry because the industry are closely uh, supervising them and they get to know them better and what way better to get to know a person you're going to hire when they are able to carry out research for you. The collaboration between university and industry in terms of research funding is also beneficial to the university as well because it provides you a channel for research and uh, founding, uh, funding opportunities. Sorry, the typo there, I've got founding, should be a funding. So you can, uh, you, you, it's additional funding support. So if you already have a student project budget, this can boost uh, what you can do if you can get some money from the industry. And this can lead to journal publications or conference presentation which is what we as academicians uh, require for our career advancement. We also um, uh, pro get an insight into industry practices because we are in academia and often we don't know what is happening in the industry. And uh, this collaboration can help academics and students understand the merits and the merits of both industry and academic practices. So you can uh, basically, this will basically lead to improvement of both uh, academia and industry practices. Improved curriculum. Yeah, when we teach students, we have our curriculum and it's nice to be able to tailor it to the industry needs. All right, so this new research knowledge that we gain by collaborative activity can be transferred to the students through course curriculum changes to keep it current. Another benefit of collaborative research with the industry is that you get access to industry expertise. I have had uh, a person, I'm working currently with a honey company and the person who's doing, carrying out the research with me has already got a PhD and uh, she worked on Manuka honey. So uh, that's great. You see, so they're not just uh, business people. Uh, some of these uh, industries also employ a lot of people uh, who are strong in research to be able to, to work co collaboratively with, with the university. So that's such a great opportunity because some, in my case, I get the industry person who's a researcher to work alongside my students and the students uh, get to learn a lot uh, from them. How about benefit to, to the industry? What are the benefits? Of course, yes, uh, with uh, research, 
you have access to additional employees. So you don't only have a team from the industry, you have faculty members involved and maybe several students. So this benefits the industry because they don't need to have additional employees because um, they, they have a team to work with. And the students working on projects are monitored by industry personnel and they will provide insight to their capabilities as future full-time employees. So you, you get someone you can employ and you're confident about. Sometimes you just interview a person, but you don't know them that well. And uh, that's why industries are, are very keen on uh, fostering uh, this co collaboration with uh, academia. Access to fa faculty expertise. So they may approach you, but they have the whole faculty expertise behind them as well. And uh, this is really beneficial to them. And when, what I find is some companies, especially the small medium enterprises, they don't have research facilities because it's, it's a lot of mon money to pump into. And so uh, this collaborative research provides the industry uh, to carry out research at a lower cost. Finally, the benefit to industry is that they own the fi final product. So they will usually get you to sign some sort of agreement, all right? Um, and uh, most of the time they get the copyright and patent, but sometimes it's really good because they're not all out uh, about getting copyrights and patents. They want to share their knowledge and uh, they, they are interested in publishing their research too. So I, I've been um, quite lucky that some of the industries that I work with uh, are interested in, in that aspect as well. But for most of them, uh, they, they want you to work on products and uh, the final product becomes theirs. I'm just going to share with you uh, a, a New Zealand uh, innovation in agency. Callahan Innovation. And this is where we get co-funding uh, between the industries, but it's not the universities that uh, pay for the other 60%, it's uh, this organization. So why would industry want to do work um, with, with academia? They actually get a research and development tax incentive or the RGTI, and this offers a tax credit equal to 15% of the eligible R&D expenditure. So you're getting some of your money back from the tax man. In New Zealand, the tax rate is quite high for companies. It's about 33%. Uh, so uh, it's different. So if you can knock off maybe 15% and, and use that for R&D, why not? Investing in R&D can help boost businesses. And uh, the reason why Callahan Innovation was established is to increase the diversity and productivity of New Zealand's economy. There are many types of fundings uh, within Callahan Innovation. We have project grants, you're pro probably all familiar with that, where, uh, whereby you get a money, you get money and uh, this uh, project grant provides co-funding of up to 40% for eligible businesses to invest in distinct research and development projects. Before uh, 2016, it used to be a co-funding of 50 and 50%, yeah, between Callahan and, and the industry. So it's not so much the university here. So uh, every time uh, when you start off as a lecturer, you, you can, uh, this will encourage you to seek out industries you can work with, and um, you can then apply for this funding with them and put this application through Callahan. 
innovation. I currently work with the experiment company and uh, they basically work uh, uh, with a lot of New Zealand honey. The most fam famous honey you've probably heard of is Manuka honey. And Manuka honey is really, I would say, um, the, one of the most expensive honey. Uh, really, I mean, it, it is very expensive. Even a bottle of New Zealand honey, and that's not Manuka, is a, around 50 ringgit in the supermarkets for a small bottle. So uh, there's a lot of uh, interest in honey, and it's not just Manuka honey that is uh, that has bioactive components. A lot of the honey New Zealand that that's produced in New Zealand have also got active polyphenols, and so um, they have had uh, quite a few projects. All right, so in this case, it's a project grant. Maybe not that much, uh, just looking at the polyphenols. And currently, I am working with them. So this is one where uh, I am uh, involved with, with this company. And it's on the identification, analysis, and testing of arabinogalactan proteins. These are bioactive proteins. And this is found in not manuka honey, but another honey that's closely closely related to manuka, which is kanuka honey. And we're looking at the uh, at uh, bioactive proteins like epicimin, and then uh, there's also the TNF alpha in in the honey. And I've got a student working on this project. We've also had some experience working with the um, with uh, the industry that produces olive oil but when you look at the company's name it's olive olivado it's olive oil but they also um, make avocado oil probably you've not seen them in the supermarket much and if you see them they're very expensive and the problem with uh, avocado is that there's a lot of waste produced when producing avocado oil. And so uh, uh, alongside my uh, colleagues in, in food science, uh, Rothman Kam, who is our, who is the PI for this project, uh, managed to uh, obtain a grant value of $90,999 dollars uh, for a three years project and this as you can see is not a it's a student fellowship grant so it pays for a phd students and uh, phd students in uh, new zealand if they get a scholarship it's about twenty five thousand a year uh, and that excludes tuition tuition will uh, be paid by the by the organization as well and that's why if you see uh, 25 times 3 is 75,000, then the remaining money may go towards uh, the payment of tuition fees and some, some consumables. It's been really good. So I co-supervise this person here, Rahul. He's graduating uh, soon. In fact, uh, his oral exam will be next week, uh, Wednesday next week. And uh, he got the grant to undertake uh, research work in terms of um, what to do with the avocado waste. What do you do with them? What do you do with the peels, the seeds, uh, and the pulp that is produced uh, during um, production of uh, avocado oil? So we've been quite successful. Uh, he's he's uh, submitted his thesis and he's already got three publications, two in food chemistry and one in foods, all, all Q1 journals. And this is before he goes for his um, exam, oral exam. You can see uh, he's looked at uh, spray dry, drying of avocado waste water and using the powder as a food preservative for preventing lipid peroxidation, 
Then uh, he looked at uh, the conversion of industrial organic waste from cold pressed avocado oil production into a potential food preservative. So we are converting the waste to something useful that we can add to food and prevent oxidation basically. That's also um, with the experiment company, um, they, they had a student fellowship grant. I was not involved uh, with this, but they had a master's student for diastase research study. All right, so diastase is an enzyme and it's an indicator of how processed your honey is. And so uh, you can have a smaller amount here, but that can help fund a master's student. You can have student career grants. And uh, this is interesting because often we have students who are graduating um, from their master's program and they want to get a job. So sometimes what happens is I get emailed by companies asking, do you have students because we've obtained a grant from Callahan Innovation and we can provide the first six months salary to assist masters and PhD students, uh, PhD graduates to get their first job. You know how important get, uh, getting a job is uh, for, for students? That's the first and foremost thing in their mind. And you'll be surprised that more industries are keen on taking on students who have done further studies and not just done uh, work, um, their studies at undergraduate level because there's a lot more research involved in science. And you see here, Amy, she's my master's student, and she got a grant from Callahan to work uh, with a company, a, a vegan food company. I don't know why, but vegan food is taking off in New Zealand uh, in quite big leaps, not so much uh, plant proteins, but, but vegan products. Uh, it must be all this um, hype about uh, sustainability and uh, being environmentally conscious. And so this is a company, Pass Elements Limited. So she worked there. And what happened, this is a startup company. And they offered, uh, they, they gave a grant. Yes, so uh, it's like a, a working grant. So she gets paid um to to work with them and she was able to develop all this interesting uh, vegan vegan food products vegan food products i must say can fetch a very a, pre a premium price in new zealand i'm not so convinced by the flavor and the taste so uh i i i i personally am am not prepared to pay a premium for products like this, but I, I've seen a few vegan companies taking off in New Zealand and I'm surprised myself. So she she got uh, that opportunity and this company uh, then moved from uh, their, their uh, factory in Auckland and uh, they, are, they are establishing the company in Wellington now and they've taken another student of ours. So it provides great career opportunities for students who graduate. Experience grants. Okay, so this is um, not, uh, not something that uh, is uncommon. Uh, actually, a lot of the uh, funding that you get from Callahan are experience grants, and they are designed for undergraduate work experience. So it's not just postgraduate. Uh, this this will be more competitive than the postgraduate uh, sort of um, funding like career grants and all that. So with career grants, they're looking for postgraduates in, in general. With experience grants, they just want uh, undergraduate working on a project and they get paid. So you can see it's so competitive because how many undergraduates do you have? You have many. So you have many vying for uh, this sort of grants. So the possibility of getting it is a bit smaller compared to career grants. 
So the student will work on a research and development project or activity that the company is interested in. So you can see Sanford Limited is a seafood company in New Zealand, and they've had several grants from Callaghan Innovation on many, many projects. Currently, they're working with my, one of my colleagues, Rothman Cam, and he is um, looking, uh, working closely with Sanford and uh, a bit like what he did with uh, avocado waste, uh, they are looking at what they could do with the seafood waste. So in the long run, it's not going to be sustainable, sustainable to uh, just throw away all this waste. So there, if there are ways to convert uh, the waste to something useful, it's, it always calls for a project. And that's why they've, they've been very active so you can see here, develop, for example, developing smart tools to assess muscle composition and condition to crop uh, for crop harvest disorder decisions. Okay, for example, innovative muscle extracts. Okay, and marine nutraceutical product research and development. Uh, the one my uh, current colleague is heading is waste that they get from salmon production. It's not here because uh because it's not completed so you only get to see completed projects if you go to their website i'll show you the website if we have some time so uh, i think the most current one is uh, bioactive scale up and commercialization and you can see that this is a company that actively uh, gets funding uh, from Callahan Innovation. It's a very rich company. In fact, one of my PhD students who graduated had his first job here before moving on to Amsterdam. So there are challenges that exist in collaborative industry research. You know that we've been uh, through COVID and just came out of it, and still we have COVID around us. I don't know what it's like in Malaysia, but in New Zealand, we're not having as many students coming through the university. It's just that it's been difficult and some are, students are actually forced to uh, look for jobs in, instead of continuing their education. So one of the challenges with um, industry research is there are not enough interested students. You have many students clamoring for the internship grants. Yes, internships are highly competitive. And I, I can tell you that because in New Zealand, you if you're doing engineering, you need to work with a, with a company. And because you're required to do at least 600 hours with, with the industry, uh, they are, just imagine how many hundreds of students clamoring for just a few internships. So internships different, but if you have career grants, you have project grants that involve higher um, research degrees, they are not enough interested students because most of our students want to work after obtaining their first degree. I'm sure you will agree with me. All right. So, but when it comes to research, we need it done by a postgraduate student. Yes, you can get an undergraduate research student, but the depth will not be enough. Another challenge is not enough funding. And that's the same all over the world. And with COVID, it's been worse. And uh, some companies are, have, have been forced to close down. Some companies have been forced to merge. And uh, when you have collaborative industry re research and you have mergers of company, the collaborators uh, who are often managerial length um, at, because they are sought uh, mainly for their financial decision-making authority, they may lose jobs and this will be detrimental to the project. So when a new company comes in, uh, you know, uh, when there's a company major, they, everything changes 
they may ask for a replacement in terms of the principal investigator from the academic institution. And this can bring a lot of trouble as well uh, when, it, uh, when uh, working collaboratively with them, with a new merged company. Of course, there are a lot more challenges and I welcome you to share them with me during our discussion. I've looked, um, so apart from industry collaboration, you can also carry, carry out uh, collaboration with uh, research institutes. So in Malaysia, you have uh, Pori, you have um, a lot of uh, maybe uh, other, other research institutes and, and they tend to obtain more funding from the government because they are mainly reliant on the government for, for funding. So in New Zealand, we have the same, we call them Crown Research Institutes, and these are government-owned companies that carry out scientific research for the benefit of New Zealand. You can see several companies here, Egg Research, Plant and Food Research, Niva, ESR, Scion, GNS, and Lenke. So uh, you, you can see a lot of Maori words here. So the, uh, the second official language in New Zealand is Maori, uh, apart from English. I work closely with Ag Research here that you see in green. I've had dealings with plant and food research when, I'm, when I was working at Otago. But uh, since I moved to AUT, it's been mainly Ag Research. And this is, I'm just going to share with you some research that I carry out with them. So we, we currently have a PhD student uh, with Ag Research working on the signature quality and acceptability of ready meals that contain meat. Ag research is mainly um, agricultural research. So all that sheep, cows that you see um, in pictures when, uh, when New Zealand is depicted, okay? So it's very green, lots of animals. We, we probably have more sheep than people. Not most probably, we, we do have more sheep and people in New Zealand. And so meat is a very important commodity. Uh, most of the meat that is produced in New Zealand is for export. And uh, we only export food uh, that, are, that are fresh or frozen. So Ag Research has uh, this idea of coming up with ready meals with, with good New Zealand meat. And this comes under their research program, uh, Unlocking Value Pastoral Ingredients with the objective of uh, emergent interactions contributing to functional meals. And uh, this is a bit of research project description. All right, so uh, I'll, uh, the good thing about working with egg research is they are research scientists like us. They, they want uh, the work published. So we have a lot more things in common. Uh, they're not like it's not like working with indus industries where there's IP and patents to deal with. Sometimes uh, egg research do do want patents, but most of the time they want to share that knowledge with others. And uh, like like us in the academia, they have a lot more in common with us. In fact, working with them is a big plus because they are full time researchers, and so our students can go to uh, their labs and work there. And that's the great thing about working with Ag Research. The students I supervise do not just work at AUT, they get to work in uh, many of the uh, high-tech Ag Research labs because uh, they get a lot of funding from government. And this is a picture of Lincoln where I was, I was there for about three weeks before um, uh, taking my sabbatical in Singapore. So I was there three weeks and you can see just green passages around. And, uh, but when you go to their labs, it's extremely impressive. 
So that's me there uh, with my student, PhD student, Chaturika, and she, uh, she, she works on the characterization of fresh cook quality of meat-based ready meals. And this is in conjunction with egg research and AUT. What she's looking at is a full PhD project. So it involves chemical characterization, physical characterization, microbiological characterization. And the reason why I went to Ag Research in Lincoln is that they've got, they've got a great metabolomics team there. And I was able to work on a, uh, on a variety of uh, very high uh, throughput uh, equipments that were really sensitive that could detect metabolites uh, especially food metabolites when you're cooking. And so uh, that that's why I was there. So there are two equipments that I worked here with. Uh, the RIMS, R-E-I-M-S. Then that's the rapid evap evaporative ion mass spec and the DART, DART and MS, the direct access um, sort of a method. And uh, Another good thing that came out of egg research is they, they quite like working with AUT. So once they, they like working with you, they have their preferred universities uh, that, that they would work with. So currently, egg research works with AUT as well as Messi University. Through egg research, um, I was able to be involved in an international grant obtained by uh, Wethara Nat with Aranium, okay, uh, here who, who was the PI for this project. And we were able to get international funding from the Australian Meat Processor Corporation. And uh, he was the project leader. And you can see uh, there's this group of us and I, I'm the only one uh, from the university. The rest are all meat research scientists and, and, and you learn a lot from them. So just by having that link with research institutes, you get an opportunity to international grants as well. I'll just talk about some earlier research and I joined, as I joined AUT in 2010, there was still uh, that was available there. And so I embarked on a research uh, with them between 2013 and 2016 on red meat combi foods. Uh, and this is um, an end-to-end -end management of protein value program that was led by doctors Mustafa Farouk and Scott Nels, who were senior research scientists at Ag Research. You can see with uh, Ag Research, mainly the work has been on meat because uh, that's the, the produce that uh, you know, uh, we, we export a lot. And so this program was really interesting because uh, they get funding within uh, internal egg research funding that they can share with universities. And we were looking at um, high value meat based ingredients for manufacturers, uh, development of protein rich functional foods and ingredients. And it was really interesting because uh, we got to uh, work on quite a few interesting projects. There's uh, spaghetti new, uh, meat noodles. Okay, so you see here in this picture, spaghetti with meat. What we did was to get meat into the spaghetti. So the, the spaghetti itself was made with meat. And you think, why? Why are you putting meat in, your, in the spaghetti? Remember, our elderly population is just increasing at a, a faster pace. Yeah, we get people uh, living longer. And so how do they get their protein? They are not able to eat a slab of meat. All right, because, uh, you know, when you're older, your teeth are not that strong. So how do you get your protein? So with this uh, project, uh, with egg research, 
we came up with a variety of interesting foods that could potentially be used for the elderly. So we developed a spaghetti, meat spaghetti, a gnocchi. Gnocchi is a, an Italian uh, pasta, and that's what you see on the left here. It's normally made from potato, but, but we also managed to incorporate meat into gnocchi so that uh, people who are elderly are able to obtain their protein. Uh, some of the products that were developed in ag research it, itself was they developed a meat ice cream, they uh, developed a meat bread. I was not involved, but, but they had students from um, other universities who were required to do their internships, and those were the students who developed these innovative products. And we even developed a, a yogurt that contained meat. So you'd be thinking, oh. But um, the good news is that we were able to, to publish this work. And so from this project, we 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 had um, we were invited to write a review on novel meat and rich foods for older consumers, and this was authored by Mustafa Farouk, who was the uh, research scientist. And uh, this this has been highly cited. We've also had uh, publications coming out from the development of the gnocchi. So that's how you spell it, but not how you pronounce it. And then we we had uh, and that was in Food Science and Techno Journal of Food Science and Technology. Then we had another one in Food Chemistry, where we looked at effects of meat addition on pasta structure, nutrition, and in vitro digestibility. And you can see here um, uh, this uh, this this paper has actually been cited a lot since we published it in 2016. I'm just gonna talk a bit about internal university funding because most of us, that's where we, when, when we are starting off, this is where we get our money from, uh, our research money. It used to be better, but I, I would say now it's more challenging uh, to get research funding from it, uh, from universities internally. Uh, I was uh, successful in, uh, in quite a few, and this is all by working collaboratively with other schools and departments. I find that personally, if you start collaborating just within your department, it's good, it's a start, but you get more money when you start collaborating with others. So I've had uh, experiences with uh, people in marketing. That's how we got in strategic research investment funding with the retail advertising marketing studies. And then um, I also got involved with the people in nutrition. And uh, in 2014, I worked with uh, some with a psychologist as well. And, and this is really interesting because we were able to come up uh, with innovative order based diagnostic tests for, um, for people who have mental problems. Surprisingly, people with mental problems also have difficulty distinguishing certain flavors of uh, foods. And that's what we were doing. We were trying to formulate flavor pills. And uh, that that work with the psychologist came, we, we, we were able to come up um, in uh, with papers. And you can see here uh, papers uh, in journals like Current Psychology and Clinical Autolaryngology. And you think, hey, what, what is she doing there? She's a food scientist, but basically you're you're, you're creating an olfactory stimuli using food flavors. And these pills can be used to assess people with psychological conditions. I've also worked with people in design. Yeah, and um, I, you, you, you see me. Um, and, and that's the good thing about being in a technology university. I worked at Otago and 
people there used to work in silos. I mean, people in psychology would never communicate with people in good science. But I think in a technology university like AUT and perhaps probably UITM, you probably are able to talk with each other a bit more. But I know for sure that's why um, I've been at AUT for 12 years now. So it's just been an interesting journey because I get to meet, uh, work with all these interesting people. So design, um, we looked at uh, the health aspects as well uh, of food. And then uh, I worked with people in the aquaculture industry. And you see here, Pawa. Pawa is uh, abalone, New Zealand uh, green footed, uh, black footed abalone. And then uh, there's also a pulse electric field treatment, which I recently got, um, not recently, well, that's my most recent one, uh, internal AUT funding that I obtained. Uh, and this was for pulse electric field treatment and drying of um, apricots. So we, we had a few publications. I remember the one with design. Uh, what we did was we look at how back, background soundscapes influence the perception of ice cream as indexed by electrophysiological measures. That's Stephen Gray here uh, from design. Uh, Daniel Shepard is from psychology. Uh, Charles Spence is a professor at University of Oxford, and he's also a psychologist. And so you can see a lot of collaborations happening, and this is what makes in uh, research interesting and publishable. Then there's um, the work with um, the group in aquaculture, and we were able to come up with a paper on, uh, you know, the changes in New Zealand abalone with pulse electric fill processing and heat treatments. And this is what you see here. This is just a shell. And uh, with uh, PEF, we are looking at the possibility of uh, processing the abalone minimally and uh, uh, getting it exported. Currently, as abalone in New Zealand is uh, cryogenically frozen, and the cost of such a process of such a process is expensive, is exorbitant. But still, people carry it out because people, uh, we, we find that people still want to buy um, abalone uh, at, at such premium prices. So, we're looking at uh, technologies that could possibly reduce the cost. There's international funding opportunities. All right, so, so far it's been uh, challenging, and uh, because New Zealand is really small. Uh, although it is a big country in terms of size, we only have a population of maybe 5.4 million. It hasn't grown much uh, in the past 16 years that I've been there. And I'll share with you uh, some, uh, some international funding opportunities uh, that uh, are available, uh, but, but not in this PowerPoint. I'll share it with you as uh, uh, in, in, in uh, you know, Firefox shortly. So I'll just finish off my presentation here and then maybe I'll share my screen. So, so you have an idea of um, uh, what sort of international fundings are available. So I'm just, I've just got two more slides. Uh, this is just showing you how much work goes into grant applications uh, when it comes to uh, international grants. Uh, we have Professor Anida here who works uh, with uh, R RMC and she, she's a good person you, you, you can talk to when you're trying to apply for international mm -hmm. fundings. You can see it's a lot more work than industrial fundings. It takes years, um, maybe a year to prepare funding. And you think, how am I going to do that? 
when I have all this teaching and admin work to do. It's always good to work in a team. And that's why I think if you work in a team, your success at international funding will be better. You may have industrial funding and that could help plant the seed for international funding. So although very uh, challenging, uh, it is possible. But by carrying out other research, by having a good team to work with, there are higher chances of success when applying for fundings like this. So, so um, usually when you are applying for international or, or big fundings, uh, you always have to come up with concept papers and these are the sort of things that um, you will need to cover, like the purpose, aims and questions, significance, problem or background, design, analysis, innovation, team. Yeah, team. The team is critical. And that's what I found with uh, my experience in terms of, uh, uh, you know, when, when people are applying for international fundings, it's always good to work with the research institutes. The researchers there do research full time and they probably have more time to apply for research fundings. And that's why it's always good to have that collaboration with research institutes as well. So thank you. Uh, but uh, that's uh, the end of my PowerPoint presentation. But I would like to share with you uh, some some websites before before I stop talking. Okay, so I'll, I'll attempt to share again and try and see if I can get it. Okay. Can you see this now? Uh, yes, Prof. Okay, so this is a website on Callahan funding and uh, that's uh, New Zealand's innovation and uh, innovation agency you can go to this website you can look go under funding and you can see the grant recipients and that's how i got the data for experiment company sanford and so on uh, it's quite interesting if you want to see what people are doing uh, that's quite interesting as well if you type proteins i think protein is a big topic and uh, it comes out with all the protein grants um, that's been uh, available. And you can see here, uh, 2022 to 2023, valorization of salmon waste as plant fertilizer using protein hydrolysis. Yeah, protein water supplements, plant-based protein variants. So this is just giving you an idea of what sort of uh, research that's been carried out and you can see a lot of them are still, still, you know, um, there's a lot of interest in food. But of course, you can, you can have an idea of, of what sort of researchers and businesses that have received Callahan Innovation R&D fundings. If you, you press this, then you, you get to see what the actual funding, how much they got. Yeah. Um, and, and, and that might be interesting to you. For example, they got 35,000 New Zealand dollars for this. We have capitalist st strategic funding as well in New Zealand. So we don't, um, I think because New Zealand is so small, we've only had uh, programs that uh, provide co-funding uh, between New Zealand, Singapore and New Zealand, China. All right. So uh, it's a shame that they, they, they haven't had uh, this sort of uh, collaboration with Southeast Asia. And so, uh, like I've mentioned, I was working in ASTAR uh, for my sabbatical, and I was there for two months before coming to Malaysia. And uh, they, had, uh, um, they had research, uh, collaborative research, between um, ASTAR and M MD. Okay, so now if they are able to announce a such collaboration the next round, the fact that I was in ASTAR for two months, 
makes it um, makes it better for me to apply for funding like this. Prior to um, going to A Star, working there, and getting to know the people, there was little possibility of me being able to obtain a grant like this. But now, with my sabbatical, that's what I've been doing: trying to go to as many countries as possible and uh, trying to see if we can get partnerships. So you can see uh, they, they obtained, uh, uh, they were successful. I'm, I'm sure this is going to happen again. And, and that's why I'll be more prepared the next time when, when this funding round uh, comes up and uh, they've had uh, cooking and processing of seaweed to improve consumer acceptance, protein digestion and nutrient bioavailability, and that's with egg research, uh, Messi University. So when I was in ASTAR, I saw these two projects being carried out side by side at the Clinical Nutri Nutrition Research Center where I was based. So um, I, I see a lot of research that people doing food science, you're also interested in seaweed, algae, plant-based protein. So these are all the uh, key uh, hot topics that's of interest in, in food research currently. There's also uh, the catalyst projects. Like I said, New Zealand is somewhat limited. So when you have a project like this, it'll be 50-50. So 50% 50 of the funding comes from New Zealand, 50% comes from China. You think, why Singapore and China? Because they have a lot of money as well. Okay, so uh, you have to be able to match. Uh, so uh, these are quite big money um, that you can apply for. And they are already uh, calling for proposals, but um, unfortunately this, this was close 31st of May. So uh, guess which country I should be going to next? China, but currently it's all closed with their COVID zero policy. So there's no possibility. There's nothing better than uh, getting out there, uh, meeting with people, people knowing you to be able to uh, get these international grants. It's, it's so, it's, it's a challenge, but uh, from challenges, that's what makes us grow and makes us better researchers. I think that's all from me. And I, I, I thank you all uh, for being so patient and listening to me so intensely. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Prof. Nazima, for a very comprehensive and insightful information regarding collaboration with uh, industry and also international collaboration. So now we open for Q&A session. Okay, so at the moment, we uh, do not have any question in the chat box. Okay, however, maybe the Secretariat will also check from the YouTube if we do have any uh, question. Okay, however, um, maybe I can uh, start with um, one question, Prof. Okay, for the Callahan uh, Innovation Center, do they also uh, collaborate with um, external university other than New Zealand's university? Yeah, no, currently it's only New Zealand. Yeah. Only available for New oh, Zealand only, university. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, yeah, they, um, yeah, it's a bit hard because your students, we can get people from overseas universities involved, but the money is not going to go there yeah they, they they tend to work with new zealand university so it's something very local but i think it's very innovative because at least the university does not need to come up with the money and, and so it's just to to help out with the new zealand economy okay uh for the uh okay so so we have a question in the chat box prof okay so it's from uh, 
uh, I will address as Dr. Muhammad Zahid. Okay, hi Prof. Uh, could please uh, give us some insight on how do the newly researchers engage or reach the expertise globally? Hmm. Yeah, I think it's for new researchers. It's it's really hard. You get you get so bogged down by by teaching, yeah, in in your first year, and you got all these uh, things that you need to do. What I would say is start working collaboratively, and uh, that's good. So uh, if you know someone in an institution overseas that's a good way to to work with someone you know it's not so easy to reach out to people i i trust me i've emailed people and and they don't reply and you think hey why are they not replying you know but they they are too busy or they don't know you so uh, that's the good thing if you have a visiting professor uh, from overseas, start start uh, that conversation with them if they know you. Because trust me, when I open my email each morning, I have many emails, right? But if it, it's an email from someone I know, I would prioritize it, right? Because you can get all this from overseas and, and you don't know what's happening, which ones you should answer. Sometimes it just gets forgotten. And that's why I think one way is um, for the young researchers to have that connection. It could be that connection with the university that you graduated from, if it's overseas, or it could be your supervisors who supervised you locally, but they've got that connection overseas. So you, you, you look at your supervisors as well for that connection. At the end of the day, it's all about networking and with Zoom and you know all these online meetings made possible due to COVID, you can reach out to even more people, I would say, compared to uh, three, four years ago, uh, if, you know, if you get them to, to reply. So if you want to go globally, you've got to be in, in contact with people and uh, work with people, show uh, them that you, you are capable of, you know, coming up with good research. And next time, you never know, they would be uh, wanting you on their team. Yeah, so I think that's very important not to just look at um, locally. Globally is good. That's a good question. So you're looking global. You've got that ambition. and. Uh, I, I never expected to have a collaboration with University of Oxford myself because I've made myself good enough in that area. You know, people uh, want to work with me. So it's different, very, very different uh, once you get uh, someone uh, internationally on board. So that's what I would say. Okay, uh, thank you, Prof. Uh, next, we have uh, another question from uh, Dr. Deepak. Okay, uh, can you comment the, the most outstanding research in your field of food and uh, science ever done presently? <laughs> thank you, Dr. Deepak. <laughs> That's an interesting question. I get, somehow, I do a lot of work in food science. You know, especially on the chemistry side, looking at um, flavors, chemical composition, processing, and somehow those type of work doesn't get noticed. I'm I'm more known for my work on ice cream and music, and uh, that's really uh, something I did not expect at all. My my humble beginnings at AUT began with. No sensory lab, no students, you know, uh, it was a difficult time for me. And it just so happened that I had this um, student in my class who owns an ice cream shop. And so that's how research started. And I got a student who loved music. 
and I met this med psychologist in um and uh, he had he he came he came up with this idea of you know um, music and ice cream together and I've never looked back since. So most of my research on how uh, flavor perception is uh, affected by um, uh, what you hear uh, rather than what you see uh, is one, I must say, uh, most uh, cited uh, research. Uh, and some, some and, and that's just your, you working collaboratively outside your department and uh, coming up with unique research. Thank you for that question. Okay, all right. Uh, so the next question, uh, I think this uh, comes from student, Prof. Okay, so uh, for current, uh, from Muhammad Azwan, Mat Isa. Okay, so for current pursuing postgraduate students, could we apply for such grant as the PI? Because we are self-finance student. Uh, your PI would be your lecturer, so if you're a postgraduate student, yeah. So you work with your with your lecturers on projects like this, and they they will supervise you once you finish your education and and you you're you're working, then you're able to be PI. Yeah. So yeah, it, it's good to see some students who are ambitious. I like that. And he's already thinking of being a PI. You know, you got a lot of good students here from Anita, <laughs> you know, uh, who, who have that ambitions. And, and that's a good thing. But you have to wait. So make sure you you, you do your PhD publish and uh, after that, go for it. Yeah. Okay, uh, Muhammad Azwan. Okay, I hope that uh, Prof uh, make it clear. Okay, you have to uh, collaborate and work with your supervisor. Okay, so second question from Dr. Deepak. Uh, what is the outcome uh, of the best solution and findings in this medical field? Publish or perish? Yeah, I think this publish or perish thing is universal. Um, it's really, really hard uh, juggling between teaching and and research. I'm not sure what what you're trying to say there. Okay, can you just repeat the question? Uh, is it about the medical field? Okay. Uh, what is the outcome of the best solutions and finding in this medical field? I think uh, it it relates to medical field, uh, publish or perish. Oh, Dr. Deepak, are you here? Would yeah, you like yeah. to talk to me? Yeah. Can we get a clear question from you, Dr. Deepak? Okay. So perhaps. Maybe you uh, email me here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. All right. Okay. Yes. Okay. So next we have one question from Dr. Shaira Ismail. Hi, Prof. Uh, what are the key things that we should highlight in our proposal to get noticed by the potential collaborators? Oh, okay. Yeah, that, that's like another talk. <laughs> that's a talk that uh, Prof. Anida can give as well <laughs> because she's the head of the grants unit in UITM. Uh, and uh, yes, uh, I would say the novelty of the project. You know, they they don't want something that is. You you think your your idea is novel, but you know if someone else has done something on it, um, even though a little, uh, it, you know, I think novelty plays a big, uh, role. Do you agree, Prof. Anita? Because yes, you, you've seen, and um, yes. You know, I can't say how do you make that novel, but sometimes all these uh, things like we have something similar, uh, we call it the master grant. It's it's a blue sky, blue sky research. You know, <laughs> and and you think, hey, how come they got funding like that? You know, and then but in the end, I I don't think I would be able to go there because 
that's probably too novel for me. But I think another good thing is uh, to make something novel. If you work collaboratively with others that are from different fields, you can come up with really unique type of research uh, that, that stands out. And that's why I've had no problems at all publishing um, my work um, with uh, where I worked with psychologists. It's really interesting because psychologists work on people. I work with people too in terms of sensory science. But uh, when you put us together, which is quite rare, uh, the research ideas you get from someone in a different field becomes valuable. So I would say uh, go with that, you know, have a brainstorming se session with someone outside your faculty and see what you can come up with. That's one, yeah. But uh, that's the main thing, the title. Yeah, then after that, of course, the team and, <clears throat> and so on. But I think the aims, objectives are, are the most important things uh, when writing a proposal. Um, but uh, the idea has to be novel. Okay, all right. So uh, I think uh, Dr. Deepak has uh, updated uh, which uh, he meant for uh, food science uh, field. So if we go back to his question, okay. So basically, uh, what is the outcome of the best solution and findings in food science and technology field, whether we need to publish or perish? Oh yeah, we definitely need to publish. We need to get our work out there. That's because as academics, our career at once when depends on it. And uh, the, the thing is, if you think about it, to climb up in terms of ranking, university rankings, international outlook is important. And how can we do that? We have to publish internationally and uh, that's how people will know what what we are able to do i don't like the word perish but it's it's really hard you know it i don't think it's right that people should perish some people who are teaching are very good teachers some uh, academics who are researchers are not that good teachers but Sometimes it's a bit unfair that you know you you get further if you if for they the people who do research gets further. So it's the university policy, and the reason they are doing it is to climb up in terms of ranking. AUT sixteen uh, twelve years ago wasn't at all like it, what it is today. Um, it's it's very sad, but we are actually uh, what they are doing to to climb up the rankings is to um, get people who are not research active out slowly, so they are not extending their contracts anymore. It's very sad because we have lost very good teachers in the process. Yeah, and why? Because they want to climb up in rankings. Why climb up in rankings? It's not so critical in some places, but in new, in overseas, in universities, we depend highly on international students. And how do international students choose their universities? They look at ranking. Yeah? Uh, and that's why you, 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 you see that's where the, the students go. Um, but if you're university business is not reliant on international students, maybe that this publish and perish won't be, um, won't be as bad, yeah, uh, in, 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 in institution, institutions where, have, where you have steady number of students. But yes, that's the disadvantage of working in overseas universities. We, we look at uh, international students as a source of income because we get very little help from, from the government. 
Okay, uh, so we have the next uh, question uh, from Muhammad Azwan. Uh, now the world is moving towards food security and sustainability. Do you think uh, it is a good issue or problem for the topic applied for the grants? I think that's where the money is anyway. Yeah, I, I was in Singapore and uh, they, there's this uh, cl clinical nutrition group that I, I was uh, I was looking at what they did and they've got a funding called Singapore Story and they've got they achieved four four million sing dollars uh for a period of three years uh just uh developing uh, plant proteins and plant protein foods and carrying out clinical trials to look at uh feeding people eating plant proteins and people who are eating meat proteins. You know, so mm. that's four million dollars. It's big money. So sustainability, I cannot stress enough, is is uh, what is driving a lot of the funding at the moment. Everywhere I go, it's plant protein, plant protein. And I, I work with egg research, and I only work with real meat protein. You know, they are on the other hand, they are there. You know, we want meat. You know, why why is this plant coming in? But whether we like it or not, plant protein is uh, the next thing because just getting protein from animals is not going to be sustainable in the long run. Yeah. Yes, uh, true. Uh, uh, Prof, um, um, we do not have any more questions in the chat box. Uh, however, uh, you did mention earlier that if uh, there is a time that if you can share with us on the Sanford Limited uh, experience, one of the project, the website, is it uh, possible? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll show you. Um, okay. I'll show you um, how to access that. That that's no problem. But that that's really good. Yeah, it's it's uh, good because you can see how much they got, what they were doing. They don't tell you what the. Uh, but just looking at the titles gives you some idea on, you know, what, mm. what industry is really interested in. Uh, yeah. In, yeah. Uh, I, I, you, you, you would be interested in that, is it? Yeah. yeah. Okay. No, no problem. Do you want anything to say, Prof Anida, on your side? You, you, yeah. yeah. Uh, I was thinking because for the Callaghan uh, Innovation, Sanford Limited, I mean they provide a platform. So for the for the communication between the academician and the industry, do, is it like uh, the 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 academician will the researcher will approach the industry and then leads to the platform, or there will be. Uh, industry listed all their problems to be solved by the researcher and then they start communicating how, how the process start prof uh, that's such a good question actually so usually who who puts in the application right yeah. that's a good yeah. question not not academia oh okay yeah it's the industry the oh, industry okay. puts it in you then they talk to you. Yeah, I mean, they will talk to you. Like uh, what's happened with the Honey Project is they, they came to meet me. They say, you know, we, we don't have the research facility, usually because it's uh, a lot more expensive to establish one if you're, you're, you're at SME. And then uh, you, you say, yeah, we, we could potentially have students we can co-supervise together. And you have that conversation and you see what they are interested in. And so what they do is they find an, a partner in academia. But it's surprising. You would think a lot of people in academia will be interested in working with them. Not really. Not really. Okay. Yeah, you, you, you think if industry comes knocking at your door, um, you know, sometimes it's difficult. In fact, uh, the person I was working, uh, she's in the honey company. She graduated from University of Auckland. You know, okay. it's the top university in, yeah. in uh, New Zealand. And yet, they were not interested. She did her PhD mm -hmm. there. And then she said, oh, I might as well go next door. And then we, we are a bit more open-minded because all the, all the well, we, 
research university or, or the top ranked universities tend to want to get the bigger slice of funding and they don't want to waste time with um, industry. Uh, and I think being a technology institute gives us uh, a good, uh, yeah, we are good, we are good people to go to because we had, we produce students who are highly skilled. Uh, mm. That's what we are known for. Our students can go out and work. And so they, I would say we are better as partners. Yeah. So I think more, more and more coming here. Uh, so all what you can do is you go out and you find the industry and say, hey, why don't you apply for a Callahan grant? Mm. Yeah, because sometimes they don't know about it. So yes. uh, if you got time, uh, talk to industries. You'll be surprised at uh, what they will, you know, they will, how they will respond. They don't know, you know, they don't look at the sites. So sometimes if companies say, if a company say, can you do some, you know, research for me? I've got small amount of money, so you can get more money. So you can double up the money or, you know, you can get 40% of it paid by Callahan Innovation and they go, really? Yeah, but you can see Sanford knows. <laughs> yeah, so that's why they've been successful. They have like six, seven different fundings and they are a big company. It's funny, mm -hmm. it's usually a big company who knows how to play uh, the game. You see, because they, they don't want to pay too much tax. So just imagine you get 15% um, of your income tax written off. So 15% uh, is a lot for a big company. Yes, yeah. We, we uh, at UITM uh, as well, we are working with the double tax exemption uh, in order to attract uh, industry to provide fund to UITM so that they can get exemption uh, from the tax. Yeah, so we are working on it. And I think uh, part of the industrial grants that coming in also being implemented in double tax exemption. I think I really admire that, you know, you see, you're, you're doing your, your Callahan innovation now at UITM. <laughs> you're doing this, you're spurring all this. And I think that's, uh, I'm, I'm very impressed, you know, at the ingenuity uh, when, when it comes to attracting fundings like this. But this is the funding, I would say, it's good, a good start for many, especially the, the younger lecturers as well, uh, you know, getting them involved. And then once you start, uh, but I don't know who writes the proposal, maybe the university does, right? Mm, yes, yeah. 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 Yes, That's normally the of the university researcher, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, it's the other way around, um, the industry. But of course, uh, the, the university will help. But some industries like Sanford, they know what to write anyway, so they don't need help. But some smaller yeah. industries, you may you may be required to put more input into the proposal, but the ones who apply would be the industry. Okay. All right. Okay. So uh, thank you, Prof. Okay. Uh, we do not have any more question in the chat box. However, I'm open for any uh, discussion, suggestion, feedbacks, uh, comments uh, from the floor uh, participants in the Webex. If you would like to highlight anything. Okay. Um, so I think um, there, there, there is no more. Uh, from the participants, uh, maybe before we end, I think uh, the office of uh, TNCPI will paste the link for the attendance uh, today. Okay, so uh, the participants can uh, fill up the attendance uh, from the using the link, and I think uh, we will would like to take a photos for this uh, session webinar session. Okay, and for that, uh, can we? A request uh, uh, participants. Okay, so at the moment we have 78 uh, participants in the session. Okay, so that we can take photo together. Okay, so the 
office of the NCPI uh, will take the photo. Uh, can can somebody give a cue whether you have to take the photo or not? <laughs> everyone ah okay okay can you speak louder okay is everyone ready okay ready ready okay ready one two three one more one two three okay thank you everyone okay thank you secretariat okay um on behalf of uh, Renew, uh, RMC, Office of the NCPI, we would like to express our uh, sincerely thank you to Prof Nazima for uh, your time this morning, uh, spending your experience, uh, sharing your experience uh, with industrial and international grants. And also thank you to the organizer, Office of uh, TNCPI uh, and also to all participants uh, who joined the session. Thank you very much and hope to see you again next time. Thank you. Assalamualaikum.